Hello, hello, folks, and welcome to our Q&A session of Radical Futures in this first episode. Um, first, we're going to do some round of introductions. Then I'm going to ask our lovely artists some questions regarding their art at the intersection of artistic practice and at the intersection of expression. Um, so first, let's start with introductions. Why don't we? Um, my name is Tanasia Jones. Um, a lot of you all know me as T. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I'm the program director at the Theater Offensive. Um, now I'm going to bop it off to this artist right here. Could you give us the names, the pronouns, and just like any titles that you're feeling and vibing with today? <laughs> Thank you. I am Chetna Mehta. My pronouns are she and they. I am a daughter and granddaughter of Indian and South African diasporas. I identify as an artist and a facilitator and an alchemist uh, because through my work with my organization, Mosaic Eye, I get to witness alchemy every day with folks in relation to their bodies, in relation to their creativity, to trauma, to liberation. And it's very joy giving and very magical. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you so much for sharing your offering just now. Like that was amazing. So thank you. Um, I'll start off with the first question here, right? Um, in these three episodes, as you know, we're really delving into the alchemy, talking about that because you just went into that, right? Um, the alchemy between artistic expression and artistic practice, right? Um, as an artist whose artistic expression is like deeply rooted in your practice, I would even say in your business that you have as well, right? How would you speak on uh, how those two things inform each other, change each other, and grow each other along the process? Mm. It's such a relevant question to this episode because I find that what sparks me, what brings me to life is making, being in the process of making, churning, listening, acting, that yin and yang practice of receiving downloads from the people I'm engaging with, the trees I'm around, the wind, um, the pain that I feel in the world and in myself, mm -hmm. and um, taking action on those. And I'm also really inspired and ignited by advising and walking hand in hand with folks as they discover themselves and their role and purpose in the world. So being a facilitator and an artist go very hand in hand. Uh, my art practice informs how I am able, again, to see the light and, and freedom in someone else because I'm constantly like looking at how I can see the light and freedom in myself in every moment. Mm -hmm. So it's very interdependent like that. And part of the unfolding of my art, uh, my work through Mosaic Eye has been such an intuitive process. Actually, it's going back to this practice of, of deep listening and sensing what is it that my body wants? How does it want to move? What, what is sparking it to life? And it's making choice after choice in, in that relation, in that guard. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's really my practice. My practice is, is listening and being in the energy of both yin and yang as I'm taking action and stepping forward while also pausing and seeing where do I need to go? Yeah. I think one of the lovely things that you just spoke on, right, is the yin and yang and the push and the pull, right? And understanding that with every creation, there is a development still in order, right? There are things that you can learn at any given process of the way. Um, and also one thing that you spoke on that I fi I'm finding very true, even in our like research of doing these episodes is um, creating in collective and collective learning is an uh, essential part of this work that we are doing, right? Um, including the diagnostic of the expression in outward. So I, I love that, thank you. Um, and also thank you for, I want to say like rooting it in embodiment and rooting it also in how you can show up fully. And one of the things I think from this episode that's really stuck with me is transitioning to the next question, um, is, um, this idea of glimmers that you have, right? And not even that you have, I feel like that I, this is probably a term that is out there. Correct me if I'm wrong, right? 
Yes, yes. Deb Dana, who does a lot of work in polyvagal theory, coined the term glimmer as opposition to trigger. Um, so yes, she's definitely a teacher in that. Awesome. And so um, I'm curious for yourself, right? What is a practice and or ritual, right, that you have adopted to help you find those glimmers? And also, I would say, because glimmers in my mind beget more glimmers, right? So, yeah. so, so like, how do you, what is a practice that you find that like finds those glimmers and also uh, cultivates them into a rolling aspect where you have more things that align you instead of not, right? Yeah, I mean, it was exactly. As you said, it does beget more glimmers. The more I see it, the more my brain is trained to notice it everywhere from the smallest thing to, for example, the sensation of like a, a really well inked pen on a piece of page um, or, you know, the sunlight streaming in my window or the feeling of my sweater on my skin. Like it's so subtle and it's so abundant. It's almost infinite in any moment when we look for it. Right. And that is an exact resistance to our evolutionary tendency to be a negativity bias, to notice the things we need to fix, the problems we need to avoid. So hence why I believe Deb, Deb Dana says glimmers are the opposite of triggers. And one thing I'll share is, is something that really helps me compile these glimmers and keep them available to me. Because when I'm regulated and when I'm feeling fine, it's easy for me to notice the glimmers. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but when I am in my like reptilian brain, in my amygdala, I'm triggered and all I could see is the problem the issue, the pain, then it's really hard for me to access uh, the glimmers as it is, I believe, for many of us. And what I invite folks to do and what I do myself here in this manifestation, I have a glimmer sachet. Um, it could be a glimmer jar. It could be a glimmer box. I keep my sachet in my box with a bunch of this is kind of like a, an altar, an altar. It's an altar box. Um, I have pictures of my ancestors. I have elements from the sea. Um, I have crystals and I have my glimmers in here. And anytime I feel like it and I'm noticing the glimmers around me, mm -hmm. I will write it on a small piece of paper and put it in my sachet. Now, glimmers, again, are things that um, inspire me into soothing, into connectedness, into joy, into pleasure. So I'll just, you know, pick one out and show you an example. Um, having a water bottle near me with clean water. Like that just gives me nice, got it? Yes, wonderful, me too, staying hydrated. And yeah. the anxiety that comes if I don't have water and I'm thirsty, you know, but to know that I do have water and that's a gift uh, is a glimmer. I'll just share one more here. Yes. <laughs> Treating my inner child or teen to boba. <laughs> oh, yes. Right. Um, so just remembering that, like, oh, okay, maybe, maybe I want some boba right now. Do I want some boba? No, but just remembering that I, I have that option is like soothing to me. So yes, um, glimmers are a way that we can just remember what brings our body soothing, peace and love and um, giving us a space that it's together that we can come to and remember those things, even when we are triggered. And I, and I love that um, this weekend, uh, Des and I were away on retreat. Des, for all of you who don't know at home, is one of the producers on this. They're here, they're around. <laughs> you just can't see them on the screen. Um, but one of the things that we spoke about was how do you write from likes before you write from dislikes, right? Of what you do like about the space. And I think glimmers really remind me of that, of like, what do we like? Sometimes I think about so much what I don't like that like, Taking, making a home in my likes is a practice that I feel like I am just cultivating now, even in my artistry. Um, so yeah, and, th and thank you for sharing that. Um, another question that I have too, that is based off of this as we pivot, right, is around this idea that we talked about earlier around collective and around meeting folks and meeting people in the, in the conversations. Um, one of the things, because I had stalked you, um, because that's what our jobs are as producers on the low key, um, that I really love is your podcast on creation for liberation. Um, and for those of you at home who are, un who are trying to figure out where to find this podcast, 
Um, go to their IG. It is on their IG there. Um, we'll post that in the chat function right now and follow and follow this podcast because it's really great. Um, but in that po- podcast, right, um, you delve into decolonizing creativity, right? And one of the things that I loved about this piece, this offering that you gave us is it's all about, number one, decolonizing creativity from the jump. Like the minute you sit down and hold that pen, here's how you can start decolonizing what this thing means, right? And so I'm really curious in having this podcast and talking to artists, creators out there, right? Um, What is maybe an idea that's come to you from this podcast that has maybe even changed your way of looking at decolonizing creation? And, or brought you a value in it that you never, that you didn't think about before it was said? Mm. The energy that inspired me to even start the podcast was the energy of experimentation, which I talked a lot about in this episode. And that is the permission to just try something and see what happens. And I've since found in doing this, as my own idea or understanding or felt sense of what decolonizing creativity means has also evolved and grown and shifted and clarified through this experiment, that um, that's what it is to me. Decolonizing creativity among many things is stepping out and being willing to listen and experiment and trust the uncertainty, Mm -hmm. collaborate a little bit with the mystery Mm -hmm. and see where it goes. And that could be the mystery of a conversation with someone else whom you have no control over what they're going to (laughs) say or (laughs) collaboration with a new medium like podcasting Mm -hmm. or or collaboration with with choosing a theme or topic, i.e. like decolonizing creativity and seeing the wisdom that it brings forth in other people. So, yes, even as so much of what's been shared on the podcast for me is not necessarily brand spanking new, right? It's not new information, which I also, it makes me feel how inherent the wisdom is to each of us. Yep. It's it served as a reminder that it's coming back to earth and connecting with the land and connecting with the earth and land within me and listening to that and moving from a place of trust, uh, moving at the pace of trust, as Adrian Marie Brown says, uh, which is slow which is slow. And it's, it's again, in that space of deep listening, the last episode from the time we're recording this with Kelsey Blackwell, who identifies as a somatic abolitionist really reminded me of the community that is the trees, the birds, the wind, the rocks outside. That community is not just human community. Community is also the beings outside who are there waiting for our recognition. She says that exactly. Like maybe there's nothing missing with community. Maybe there are just beings out here that are waiting for my recognition. And when I recognize them, I will feel connected. I do feel connected. And um, I even get chills as I as I say that or repeat that because I, I believe that is what decolonizing creativity is and decolonizing our bodies and minds is, is being in touch with with the the wider community that is very available to us. Mm-hmm. And I love this idea. And I love this, not even idea, I love this notion of like acknowledging as a form of connecting just in that, right? About I, and I think we we follow Adrian Marie Brown here so much. Um, emergent strategy is really doused in our theater and what we do. And I think that one of the things that is really centered in that emergent strategy work, which you've already said too, is the going slow and the realizing the power in the smallest of movements sometimes, right? Um, so thank you so much for offering that. Um, we have concluded our Q&A as we do not want this episode to run crazy long. But what I want you to say, what I want to say is thank you um, for coming, for sharing your knowledge, for sharing um, your presence, right? And also just for sharing just like this lovely offering to our community. Um, one of the things that we aim to do is bring communities and artists closer together and understanding that practice can be whatever you want it to be. Art does not have to be art for the sake of production or output, but art can be art as a, as a, as a tool to come closer to yourself. Um, so thank you for sharing your work in that.
Thank you so much for inviting me. And along with what you said, I really invite folks to reach out. Like, I don't want to be just on the other side of an Instagram account or on the other side of an episode. I really want to be in relationship and to learn more about folks that are resonating with doing similar work. So let's be in community and, and in conversation. So thank you so much for inviting me into this one. Thank you. Um, for those of you at home, everything and how to get connected with Chetna is in the chat function right now. So again, right, this call does not go without follow through. Look in the chat function, reach out to this beautiful human being. Um, thank you and have a wonderful rest of your day. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning into our very first episode of Radical Futures. <laughs> I know I cannot wait to go make my glimmer jar. Have you already made yours yet? All right, maybe I have to. <laughs> this small series of events is a part of our annual series of artists' offerings and workshops titled Radical Futures, which is housed in our Queer Republic programming. Through this year's Radical Futures, we are dedicating our energy towards the celebration of artistic practice, healing, and ritual reflected in QT Pac Fem-led art. Radical Futures' goals are to honor Black feminism, its legacy, and its crucial role in queer liberation, to acknowledge that Black women and femmes are inherently valuable, and that our joy in artistic practice is inherent activism to practice collective care as an essential ingredient to solidarity and collective liberation, and to amplify Black women, femmes, and gender expansive individuals. Up next, we will be exploring the practice of theatrical ceremony with Ebony Noel Golden and her production of The Keeping at Weeksfield's historical site. Link to RSVP in advance and the information regarding that episode is being dropped in the chat function right now. So go, please RSVP. If you're interested in supporting our organization and any of our future career public programming, please visit us at the theateroffensive.org. The link is in the chat right now. And I want to say support comes in a myriad of ways, right? You can support by coming. You can support by showing up. You can support by dropping us a message of love uh, that we could use. And you can support with your financial um, uh, resources as well. So there's so many different ways how to support our program. The link is in the chat. And I want to thank each and every one of you so much for joining us here for this very first episode of Radical Futures. I am Tanasia Jones again, and thank you so much for joining us. And I hope you all have a wonderful day. Bye.